Good morning. I'm the Reverend Rena Shear, and I am a friend of Lynn and Peter and their family. And on behalf of the family, I welcome all of you here today this morning. We are here today to remember and honor the life of Peter Francis Fallhaver. In one sense, death has brought us together today. In grieving, we recognize the power of connecting with one another, with each other. We are here to support each other as we make our way through the many joys and sorrows of life. In a more important sense, we've been brought together by life, Peter's life, and our love for him. And I can see that this room is filled with love this morning. We have come together to give thanks that we knew this loving, quick-witted, curious, kind and devoted husband, father, son, brother, and friend. And we are here to express gratitude for the time that we were able to spend with Peter throughout his life. It is right and fitting that we have gathered, for human life is sacred. Because we will never get to share this time again, and in deference for this occasion, I ask that you make sure that all cell phones and electronic devices are turned off now so that you can be fully present to this sacred hour. After the service, there will be a private interment for Peter's family. The family also invites you then to join them at a luncheon at the Aloft Hotel and this information is printed in your order of service. You'll notice that there is a poem in your order of service as well. Lynn asked me to read this poem today as part of the service. This is a poem that she and Peter had heard at a memorial service many years ago, a memorial service for a friend. And they were both struck by the beauty of the words and the images that are created in our minds. So please be present to hear this poem. The Ship of Life. Along the shore I spy a ship as she sets out to sea. She spreads her sails and sniffs the breeze and slips away from me. I watch her fading image shrink as she moves on and on, until at last she's but a speck. Then someone says, she's gone. Gone where? Gone only from our sight and from our farewell cries. The ship will somehow reappear to other eager eyes. Beyond the dim horizon's rim resound the welcome drums and while we're shouting, there she goes. They're shouting, here she comes. We're built to cruise, but for a while, upon this trackless sea, until one day we sail away into infinity. When Peter first became sick, I saw my role as one of pastoral support for the family, because I'm a hospital chaplain. That's what I do. And it seemed natural for me to offer spiritual care to my friends. But Lynn asked me to visit Peter specifically, to offer companionship to her husband. And so I embarked on a wonderful friendship with Peter as we became spiritual conversation partners. We were spiritual conversation partners. Most of you know that Peter studied medicine and was an accomplished physician, but he also studied philosophy and religion in his younger life. He, had, he held a master's degree in theology. Peter was hungry for meaning making throughout his life, and this hunger did not waver over the past two years. A need to talk about the big questions in life are often the marker of theological training. Questions like, what is the reason for one's existence? What is the nature of God? What is the purpose of suffering? And of course, why do bad things happen to good people? 
And we like to talk about these questions over and over again. And that's what Peter and I did. And Peter was really at a time in his life when he was exploring these questions very deeply. But the one question that we always seem to circle back around to was the question, what makes a life worth living? What makes a life worth living? Peter was reflecting on where he was in his life now that his health was, his health was failing. And by reflecting on this question over and over, Peter came to terms with the reality of his situation. When you are robbed of physical freedom and the basic safety and security of knowing how your body will function each day, your world can become very unbalanced and precarious. Your world can become very small. But, but Peter understood that even when one's body becomes sick and frail, the interior world of the mind and the soul can still flourish. There is always a choice of where one can put their energy, either in denial or anger about a situation, or by being able to move to a place of acceptance and maybe even finding pockets of gratitude in your situation. Peter wrestled with both sides of this equation, but he chose gratitude, and this was a choice. Our visits would consistently end with me saying, Peter, where is your place of gratitude today? And Peter would pause and think. And he was always so overcome by the faithfulness of his family and his friends as they accompanied him in his illness and in the changes in his life. The visits, the calls, the thoughtful notes inspired him. And he shared his gratitude for this companionship with me regularly. He was grateful for the meditation and the paints from his sister Elizabeth. He was grateful to the chance to practice Ignatian spirituality with his sister Christina. He was grateful for the visits with Justin to talk about Paris and what they loved about travel. He loved talking to Lynn about Justin and about their life. And talking about gratitude then led to discussions of the concept of humility as a person of faith. And humility is, is often characterized as a sense of genuine gratitude and a lack of arrogance. A more spiritual understanding of the concept of humility is the idea that as humans, we are often powerless to control our world and the environment. And so we must readjust our understanding of who we are in the world and simply be grateful for the gift of life as we can experience it each day. I often thought that what must have made Peter such a remarkable physician was his understanding of the spiritual dimension of humans. Peter really believed in understanding and understood the intangible quality of faith that nurtures resilience in humans and which allows us to face illness, disease, even the rigors of aging, which we all face, with some kind of grace. Peter was raised Roman Catholic, and like many of us, as we mature and experience life and what it throws at us, he was changing and becoming more expansive in all of his beliefs. And he was becoming very interested in Buddhist philosophy. And one of the favorite books that we would read was a book of the parallel sayings of Jesus and Buddha. And we would just read one short saying and then spin off a conversation. And Peter and I shared some favorite theologians. We both studied and admired the writings of the Englishman Thomas Merton, who chose to give up a life of academia and in his 30s made the decision to become a cloistered monk. Thomas Merton joined the Abbey of Gethsemane, which is just one state south of us in Kentucky. And the life of a Cistercian monk is one of silence. They take a lifelong vow of silence, except for singing at their worship services. 
their lives revolve around prayer. They pray both day and night. Prayer is their gift to the world. In one of our conversations, Peter shared with me that he had come to the realization that prayer was becoming more central to his day. He could no longer practice medicine, which had been so central to his life and his identity. He could not be the husband, the father, the son, the brother, the friend that he once had been. His situation had changed. But even when he was feeling ill and weak, even in times when he was by himself, he could still pray, he told me. He could still be of service to the world through prayer. And that is what he did every day. He prayed for the well-being of his family. He prayed for the safety and security of his friends. He prayed for his caretakers, Jan and Megan and Lolo, he had so much gratitude for the people taking care of him. He prayed for the safety and security of his friends. He prayed for the healing of our broken world. He prayed for the people gathered in this room. He prayed for you. And I am so grateful for having known Peter. And now we come to the time in the service where family and friends will come up and share their relationship with Peter and what they loved so much about him. Justin. Thank you all so very much for coming. No one who knew my dad would be at all surprised that there were so very many people who loved him so much. Um, their constant support through all this has been really meaningful to my dad and to my mom and to me. Um, unfortunately for you, I will be speaking a little bit longer because I have been asked to read remarks on behalf of my uncle Jean-Pierre in France and my aunt Christina here, so I'm reading for two. Um, my uncle's remarks are very brief, but they are in French. It's only one sentence, but I will translate after. <laughs> says, um, Peter, médecin francophile avéré, plein d'humour et de compassion, fort comme un roc auprès de ta propre famille, tu nous manqueras pour toujours, mais nous t'oublierons jamais. Says Peter, doctor, avowed francophile, full of humor and compassion, strong like a rock beside your family. We will miss you forever, but we will never forget you. And next here are the remarks from my aunt Christina. When I was born, Peter had just turned five years old, so I know all of his early days comes from family lore and pictures. He had a sister, Roberta, 20 months older than him, who, when he was born, reportedly did not take well to the appearance of a baby in her life. <laughs> I've seen one family photo in particular that captures a curly-haired cherub Peter with Roberta glowering at him over her stuffed animal. I imagine that when his elder sister's drama raged, he simply thought, what's all the fuss about? They were temperamentally different, but grew very close. Another family picture captures their hug at my baptism. I wonder if he was surprised, but I imagine he was grateful for the show of affection. But those two things, gratitude and affection, came naturally to him. After preschool in France with Roberta, Peter returned to the United States and started elementary school, a place he talked about only a little, perhaps because he did not want to dwell on how much he disliked it, and on a third grade teacher who hated little boys. During those years, he acquired a third sister when he was nine, Elizabeth. He was an amazing big brother to both of us for all our lives. Protective, caring, supportive, teasing, and most of all, playful. That says a lot. On our walks to Sunday school, he even pretended to be blind and let me lead him into lampposts and bushes, which apparently <laughs> amused me. <laughs> Later, he loved to play basketball with the neighborhood kids, who remember him now for his niceness. He had a gift for friendship. From his earliest years, his kindness and gentleness were all there. These are no small things in this world. High school brought him challenges. His feet fell apart as he grew taller, and he had to give up playing basketball. College in a small farming town in Minnesota was a shock to his roots in Chicago. 
Thankfully, over the summer when we were at St. John's College, he tried out seminars and knew he'd found a better community for himself. He transferred promptly, being called to the intellectual challenge and to the beautiful mountains of Santa Fe. That said, in my mind, he really blossomed when the entire family spent an incomparable year in Paris, and he took advantage to study at the Sorbonne, where he fell in love with French culture too, a love that Justin carries forward. He kept his love of France and the Southwest his entire life. Later, he had a series of unfortunate challenges. As a senior in college, his eyes failed him, but he persevered. When he thought he couldn't go to medical school because of those eyes, he persevered. He first enrolled in biology classes, but then found work with Dr. Harper in nuclear medicine at the U of Chicago, a fortuitous and early introduction to his future career. He took advantage of the tuition benefit and earned a master's in divinity while working too. With patience, he kept applying to medical school until he finally was on his way to be a doctor, his career choice from a very young age. Our father died suddenly during his first month of medical school, but he kept going. He is a role model for what one person can do with great determination and for how to take advantage of what life offers even when it offers difficulties. Even in the midst of this terrible winter of these last two years, Peter seemed to hold an enduring faith in the world, which he communicated quietly through his sense of hope and his presence. This was not a fluke, it's how he lived his entire life. I will miss our talks about the latest podcast or book he recently listened to. I will miss hearing about his later weird dream about the devil and his fondness for jalapeno chocolate, for example. I will miss learning the ways in which an Ignatian prayer helped him. He taught us all about fortitude and about abiding with grace. Uh, lastly, I'll speak for myself, and then I promise to move on. I woke up a few days ago with the realization that it would be the first day of my life where my dad was not there. I've had the singular good fortune to know Peter Fallhaber every second of my life. As you all can expect, as a father, he was as caring and patient as he was with all things. I do not think I can recall a time when we really argued. His strategy for parenting was to always give me love and gentle guidance, even when I thought I didn't need it, and especially when he knew that I did. Even though he was often busy as a successful physician, I never felt that he did not have time for me. I was always excited to see him when he got home from work, and I knew that he felt the same way. There are so many memories that I will always cherish. When I was little, I would sit on one huge foot grab his leg and he would walk around, which I thought was the most fun thing ever. <laughs> For bedtime stories, he invented a whole woodland world full of talking animals. Later, I found that we shared many common interests and we could share our thoughts about politics, history, religion, languages, or music. He seemed to know a little bit about everything. In medicine, he traveled all over the world to teach about new advances in technology and radiology. When I was younger, I would proudly tell my friends that my dad was famous. For me too, dad was also a great teacher. He taught me so much. Once on the way back from our weekly workouts, we stopped in a parking lot and he showed me how to drive a car for the first time. He taught me how to play chess and we eventually developed a friendly rivalry just between us. Most importantly, the way he lived his life taught me what a man should be. Thoughtful, even-tempered, respectful, and kind. Let's not forget well-dressed. <laughs> I could go on all day. His kindness and patience w always were and always will be an inspiration. I do my best to follow his model. Throughout his life, he never hesitated to help someone else when needed. I suppose it should come as no surprise then that he was helping someone on the day that he met the love of his life, my mother, Lynn. They lived nearby to each other but ne might never have met if each of them were not so considerate of others. Less than a year later, they were engaged. They always said that they learned everything they needed to know about each other's character from that first meeting. Their relationship showed me what real love looks like. Two years ago, our lives changed forever. What dad went through might easily have made someone else depressed or angry, not him. Until the very end, he continually astonished us all with his unwavering determination to keep fighting and enjoying time with his family and friends for as long as he could. He never gave up hope and never stopped dreaming of riding his bicycle or traveling around the world with us. Dad was a powerful force of love and goodness in the world and he touched the lives of each of us deeply. Each of us is here because of the love we feel for him. We will all miss him in the coming years, but we will never forget what an incredible man he was and we will try to live by his example always. 
I thank you all for being here again and for the love and support you have shown him, my mom, and me during these past few years and these past few days. Lizzie, for those of you who don't know, I'm Peter's youngest sister. And um, I want to start just say a few words on behalf of Martha Louise Fallhaber, who can't be with us today. Peter's mom, um, who really wanted to thank you all for being here um, and for your love and support, which has been tremendous during this hard time. Um, I was looking with her, I was showing her Justin's beautiful post, um, and, and some of the posts from all over the world, and all the tremendous, uh, condolences that were coming from our family in France, and our people in Chicago, and, uh, it means so much to her, and, and it's amazing, and so she's with my husband in Denver, and, Christina's family and our family in France, they're all with us here today in their hearts. Um, so, uh, a few words about my brother, and this is my sister, Roberta. She's with us too, as always. She's leaving her <laughs> Angora with me. My brother, like myself, much to Lynn's chagrin, saved stuff. And a couple years ago when he and Lynn and Justin came to visit us in Denver, he brought a very special box and inside that box was this paper that I had written in 1978 and somehow it had escaped the purge and it was written about a very special person. And you can see I got an A on it. And uh, that special person was my brother. I was very fond of him. Uh, to say the least. And he simply, to steal a phrase from Justin, he was the best big brother a tomboy could ever have. He was also the best brother a cantankerous middle child could want. That's from the youngest sister's perspective. She was a cranky teenager. <laughs> Sorry, Christina. <laughs> And he was also the best brother a bossy big sister could hope for. And he was kind of the peacemaker in our family, you know, all those hormones in the one bathroom. Poor guy. But very simply, he was the best, And but you all know that. So as the sort of obnoxious little sister, I'm here to tell you just a few things that you didn't know. But I couldn't think of anything embarrassing to tell you, you know, because he's, there's just nothing but endearing stories, you know. He's just that kind of guy. And so I thought I would tell you a silly first memory. Like my first memory of my childhood was when I was four and I would just attack him, you know. And it's funny, Justin, you bring up that memory of riding his foot. I did the same thing. <laughs> it's just the best thing. And sometimes I would just attack him and he would bundle me up in a blanket and he would carry me up the stairs and pretend to flush me down the toilet and I would make him do it again and again and again and again and I would scream with delight and it was just great and over the years the antics would get more and more creative and complicated and I was just his nutty bohemian wacky little sister who couldn't figure it out over the years and he was always there and supportive for me and I suspect he was there for many of you, too, in that way. He was there for all of us. And he and I had some excellent creative adventures together as well. When I was in high school, we took this wacky sculpting class with this nutty 
far out Hyde Park artists. There was a lot of interesting people in Hyde Park. And then after my college years, he and I took a figure drawing class. He was just a really creative person. And, and he was this gifted writer as well. And he had this incredibly elegant, spidery handwriting. And any of you who were lucky enough to receive a card from him, I know you treasure those. And I know it's one of the things that even Lynn will save forever, right? Those cards. Um, and as Christina mentioned, he had a love of nature, and that love of nature blossomed in the high desert of New Mexico. And something about that landscape, it just seeps into your bones. And it's inspired him to hike the Grand Canyon, even with those feet. He went to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back up. He made it. And something about the Southwest pulled him back there again and again. And I think that his experiences in that expansive landscape and probably, you know, all the philosophers and Greeks and translating the Bible, something about that, you know, pulled him into that interest in theology and, and a master's in divinity. Who would have thunk it? Perhaps some of you didn't know he had that. It's amazing. The man had a phenomenal breadth of interest, did he not? And one could talk to him about anything, and we did, right? It, it was brilliant. He was brilliant. But always his great dream was to get to med school. And while waiting for replacement corneas to come within reach, he worked at the U of Chicago, the new med lab, where he was having to inject experimental mice with radioactive material. I was fascinated. I would visit him often there as ever. He would patiently explain the complicated means to an end, lacing the science with philosophical underpinnings, as was his wont. <sighs> Patience and perseverance. It's a theme, right? These are two character traits my brother had in ample reserve. Perseverance furthers. He would always remind me of that, a phrase from the I Ching. If you don't know what that is, you've got to Google it. Toss coins. He was into the I Ching from his college days. Patience and perseverance got him through med school with a plum. Oh, and besides being a radiologist, you know, he became, I mean, he was a palliative care specialist. He was an elder care specialist, as we know. And he became a specialist in anything and everything we could possibly imagine that, you know, whatever disease or syndrome we thought we had, he became a specialist <laughs> in that to consult with us on. So anyway, but I digress, as Peter would say, right? <sighs> patience and perseverance. It got him through many challenges in life and with grace and poise. And these characteristics certainly rose to the occasion with him these past two years. So at the end of this little essay, hmm, sorry, uh, that I wrote about my brother. I ended it with a hope that someday, when I grew older, I would be able to help someone in the way that he helped me. And I will tell you that even um, this past fall, working on his writing, and I think Patricia was helping with that. Patricia, I haven't met you yet, but I hope to meet you. In the most recent update he sent to me, he wrote, have learned to meditate. Maybe I can teach meditation. So ever the practicing physician, the caring human being, what a good egg. I mean, what a good egg, right? He was determined to find a new avenue. So if we can all pay forward a fraction of his goodness, the world will be a kinder, gentler, more thoughtful place. Ah, we love you dearly, Pia Flyers. And oh, by the way, he nicknamed me Lizard, and I loved that nickname. I even came up with a logo for it. You know, I can draw it on a napkin for you later at luncheon. And he nicknamed Roberta the bird dog, and she kept that all her life. So we love you dearly, and may your memory 
be for keeping us on our toes. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to share, I've been asked to share, Peter was my friend. I met Peter first when we began our training as hospital interns at University Hospitals here in Cleveland, Case Western Reserve University. It was 1990, and we had both come from different medical schools. We went on together to share time as residents in radiology, as fellows in different subspecialties of radiology, and ultimately developed as faculty into the same department. Along the way, he met and married Lynn. And when Justin entered their lives, we shared experiences of raising our family children together. I've known Peter as the bachelor, the husband, and the father, and my friend. To be clear, our work and our lives have been entwined for 30 years, really the bulk of our combined adult lives since that first meeting. And from the beginning, Peter and I, as we learned and met, for me, I encountered a deep intellect, a mind bent on thorough examination of facts, issues, implications, and impacts. Peter never took the fast path or skimmed the surface. His office was a testament to this, with his seemingly antiquated collection of voluminous texts, numerous journals, magazines, and of course, historical artifacts, remnants of his love of history, including the history of our chosen field didn't know, his favorite hobby, naturally, was to read, read voraciously, deeply, seemingly composed of hours in silence in a favored chair. Large tomes, whether fiction, history, divinity, or philosophy. And I must share that perhaps therein, lay the secret of our friendship. Because despite seemingly very different personalities, if I may, me of sort of the quick wit, the light disdain of French, France, <laughs> perpetual impatience, a strong desire to act immediately, in contrast to his, long considerations, endless patience, French-speaking Francophile, and a reticence to move too quickly before understanding what might ensue from such action. Our commonality lay in the deepest desire to understand, to influence, nay, I might say, to improve the very world around us. Through time, and a lot of time, I learned to appreciate his inherent need, goal, wish to do the right thing for others, to strive to heal the infirm, to uphold the best ethical choices, no matter the other paths offered, even demanded by the world around us. To understand the Peter we have so recently and finally lost, you must appreciate his unfailing resolve to stand above the fray, to support those around him, to love his family thoroughly, to elevate those learning and those serving. And then, of course, to share what he learned with many and often, Peter was an educator, 
most consistently across the decades in his area of subspecialization with the advent of positron scanning. And then it's widening use in applications throughout medicine. He was rightly known internationally and throughout the United States for his professional expertise in this arena. He was an invited speaker time and time again, 95 invited lectures, nearly 50 educational podcasts. He spoke to numerous audiences to teach other physicians the knowledge required for correct use and interpretation on this, his domain. His educational prowess stemmed from ongoing clinical research through nuclear medicine, 36 peer-reviewed publications, and he still had energy to mentor 24 fellows over the years, often publishing or presenting at national meetings with them. And beyond these wide achievements, though, remains something less obvious, less quantifiable, less tangible of how my dear friend Peter accomplished all this and more. He was a loyal, caring son to Martha, brother to Roberta, Christina, Lizzie, and ever the true advocate for Justin, ever vested in what might make his beloved Lynn more content, more fulfilled. He was a doctor's doctor. It was he that our colleagues in radiology sought to help clarify what was difficult for all. Yet he provided that view always with ease and smoothly. It was never about when was good for Peter. Never mind that for all those years, he was managing at the same time his physical ailments daily, which remained invisible to nearly everyone. For all his physical stature, his way was the gentle, quiet path. It never mattered to him, really, that in our modern world, those seemingly raised high were the loud, the brash, the self-serving. He just wouldn't yield wouldn't go there, wouldn't dignify those paths, not even as a minimally viable option. To the very end, Peter was always extremely well liked by so many, and there can be no doubt of why, no doubt at all. In the end, and looking back, to me what's so remarkable is that Peter identified me too as a friend. What an honor to have a man of such character, a character that he built and he held with steadfast determination, not by any accident or randomness, that a man of such high purposeful character, Peter Fallhaber, always called me friend. That word friend defined commonly as one for whom there is affection and esteem. For me then, Peter Fallhaber will have always been my esteemed friend. Now, I have skimmed the world and really the aura of the late Dr. Peter Fallhaber, but I can't stop without a few other points to note. I've asked myself these last few days, what have I learned from Peter? I've shared some of the deep, important points I hope already, and now I must add the following, which I hope in his honor will endeavor to hold. First, let us be clear. Coffee is the elixir of life. <laughs> it must be consumed from quality beans, well brewed, then whitened, not with chemical or milk, cream, at least if that finery is available. Several of us can, I'm sure, even recall when he awoke from one or another anesthesia medical events, the first thing you'd hear is, where's my coffee? <laughs> Second, books are the meaning of human life. 
After all, he'd remind us by example after example after example that life is about the quiet times with the well-written, well-read book, followed by deep, erudite consideration of implications all around what was written. And third, each day was to be cherished and toasted with a glass of wine. The other elixir, preferably red. No day too long, no dinner too late. Fancy was good, desirable even, but never required. A glass or two always was. Now, despite all his great good, we now acknowledge that the very body that propelled and sustained him has now finally given out. It could not go on. For all its supportive stature, it was done. And now events have conspired, and I enthusiastically wish nothing less for our dear friend Peter Fallhaber than he have eternal peace. No one I've known ever has deserved it more. May his memories ever provide lasting grace to those who hold them. I thank you. Thank you, Lynn, Justin, and the rest of the family for giving me the honor of sharing with you for a few minutes my thoughts and memories of Peter. I had the joy of knowing PFF, as he was known to me, and I knew, he knew me as LM. We greet each other every day, PFF, LM. It was very efficient. We were colleagues in nuclear medicine since 1999, and we became fast friends almost right off the bat. He and I were an unlikely friendship, not just from a physical perspective with his one foot and three inches towering over me, not from a gender perspective, but maybe more from a personality perspective. Peter was mellow, gentle, generous, and kind. I like to think that I have those last two qualities, but no one's ever called me mellow or gentle, I have to tell you. But we became fast friends the very first day we met each other, and we will remain that way. He will always be part of the fabric of who I am. We were good for each other. He'd scrape me off the ceiling when I got bent out of shape over stuff, which happened quite frequently, I have to tell you. He taught me to move slower, to spend more time, and to just sometimes sit and think. And I was good for him, too. I'd give him that kick in the rear that he needed when he wasn't standing up for himself or when he wasn't taking the steps that he really needed to, t to take to move forward. We got each other and we made each other grow. I think over the past two years after he had a stroke, I didn't really let myself think about who Peter had been or to really dwell on our memories because I wanted to focus instead on who Peter had become and how best to connect with him in his new normal. And defying all odds, he became an even finer person than he was before. He became even more courageous. He remained just as compassionate and kind. And his incredible brain was still ticking away, just a few new deficits, but it was still ticking away like a well-oiled machine. He wanted to keep growing. And somehow, he managed to see his life, life with more optimism and hope than I know I could have. But now with the final chapter of his life on earth here at an end, I can let myself reminisce about our friendship and about who Peter was. He was a gentleman, he was a scholar, he was a visionary, a Renaissance man, and yet one of the most humble and down to earth people I have ever met. And boy, did we have fun together. I remember traveling to a meeting with him in Las Vegas. We were, we were both speaking, and for some reason, the meeting organizers sent a Rolls-Royce Phantom limousine to pick us up. <laughs> it was the first car that he ever fit in comfortably. <laughs> so as we pulled up to the hotel, a crowd of people and paparazzi gathered with their cell phones at the ready to take photos of the stars who surely must be contained within. And as we emerged, 
the disappointment was palpable. <laughs> So, but we called ourselves the nuclear medicine rock stars for the rest of the trip. We knew who we were, and they still don't know who they missed. And it's prodigious memory. Every so often, we'd come across a head-scratching case, and we'd talk about it and chew it over, and then he would say, aha. And he would disappear into his overfilled office that was crammed with journals and books and personal mementos, including photos of his beloved family and for reasons that are still unknown to me, also contained a monkey skull with a cigarette in its mouth. <laughs> and within a matter of moments, he would emerge triumphantly with a journal of nuclear medicine from 20 years prior, which had that exact case in it that we'd just been discussing. He was a natural born teacher. I posted his obituary on Facebook because I knew the network of people who cared about him and whom he had taught and mentored was even more expansive than I could even imagine. And I was right. The tributes that came flowing back to Peter were what an unbelievable teacher he was, how dedicated he was, how much they had learned from him, and simply put, what an absolute joy he was to be around. And a couple people remembered that his favorite swear word was applesauce. In a world that spins too fast, Peter gave freely of two of the most precious gifts, his time and his attention. And so PFF, PFF, you have left this mortal life, but I know that you're in a better place and that you're likely having stimulating discussions with some of the best and greatest minds in history and that you're more than holding your own. But for those of us who remain behind, PFF leaves us a very large Peter-shaped hole one that's much, much larger in size than even his towering six foot seven stature would indicate. But I find solace in the fact that he was a true friend, a real friend, a role model, and an inspiration, and he leaves us with many, many fond memories. He was one of the finest human beings I have ever had the privilege of meeting, and I feel so honored that he called me his friend. He leaves behind a true legacy, one that we all aspire towards. He left the world a better place than he found it. And so PFF model grace, humanity, and wisdom. And he'll serve as an inspiration to me for the rest of my life. But I'm still going to miss him a heck of a lot. But for the Fall Harbor Jaskaluk family, please know that your family is always here with you. Renee's agreed to come up and help me a little bit with this. Everyone has spoken so eloquently of Peter and there's not a lot we're gonna be able to add to what you've already heard. We know it's pretty traditional to stand up here and eloquently talk about Peter, but we're not going to do that. It would be easy to reminisce about the first times we met him, about how we all couldn't believe how lucky the family, and yes, we suppose Lynn too, was to welcome such a tall, handsome man with a Renaissance intellect, wonderful sense of humor, and a beautiful spirit into our lives. We would talk about how he embraced our somewhat quirky family and its Jewish traditions, or expounded upon how he was, at least outwardly, always willing to, to put up with our visits upstairs in the guest suite and host the countless family gatherings, and talk about his sh shared devotion to morning coffee and evening wine with his sister-in-law, Debbie. We probably couldn't begin to say how much our parents loved him and how much peace of mind our extended family got from knowing Peter was always there to help when a medical question or crisis arose. Even when his own problems would rear up, he was always there for us. We would talk about the incredible strength and perseverance that Peter showed these last few years, how he wouldn't let Lynn sell the bicycle, because for him it represented a recovery goal. And of course, the easiest thing would be to say how much joy he brought to our sister Lynn and nephew Justin, watching Lynn and Peter wink secretively at each other, or Justin and Peter sharing private chats in French, which touched our hearts. But that
that's not what we wanted to talk about. No, we wanted to talk about all of you. We were here when he got the news about the stroke and when Peter spoke his first words again. And during the last week and during all the weeks in between for the last two years. And that's when we've seen what amazing group of friends and colleagues and yes, loved ones, Peter and Lynn have surrounded themselves with here in Cleveland. We've watched you come week after week, month after month, sharing the good and the not so good days. Riding the old Euclid Beach roller coaster looks calm compared to the ride that you've all been on. And for all that, your many visits, and dinners, and chats, and warm moments, and hand holding, we want to thank you. This warm, expansive support circle is not something that many people have and is something to be envied and hopefully emulated. So you're all a reflection of the person that Peter was and his affection of the world, his, his effect on the world. You basically are what gave him such a wonderful life. So perhaps it's most appropriate at this time of the year to borrow a line from the movie and just say to Peter. <laughs> to Peter, the luckiest man we've known. Please join me now in the Litany of Remembrance from the Jewish Book of Prayer. After each line that I read, you simply recite, we remember them. In the rising of the sun and in its going down, we remember them. In the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them in the opening of the buds and in the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of skies and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. In the rustling of the leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. In the beginning of the year and when it ends, we remember them. When we are weary and in need of strength, we remember them. When we 
are lost and sick at heart, we remember them. When we have joys and special celebrations that we yearn to share, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are a part of us. We remember them. Now please join me in a time of what some call prayer and others call mindful meditation. God of many names and whom we seek by many paths and in whom there is rest and peace for all who suffer. You give us life and then you receive us back again into your arms when we are weary. We give you back the life of one whom we love, Peter Fallhaber. He is now deeply held in your presence. There too, we in turn will find our rest. In the comfort of your peace, may we find the strength for the duties of this day. Spirit of life and love, you help heal our hearts as we join in spirit with all who must face the sorrow of bereavement. And we who are gathered here today express an abiding trust in the timing of the world and in love's immortality. Amen. Life is a gift that none of us asked for or earned. It was simply given to us. Having received the gift of life, we're given choices about what to do with that life. We can sustain and continue life. We can live in ways that are life-giving. And when it is time, we return the gift of life to its source. And so we have today. We leave this place, but not the memory of Peter and the mark that he has made upon our lives. That is with us today and tomorrow and every day hereafter. May it be so.